All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Elena Marks, and I want to welcome you to our webinar in which Dr. Caroline Fichtenberg will introduce you to the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, or SIREN. SIREN really is my go-to source for high-quality evidence and curated findings on strategies for addressing non-medical drivers within the healthcare delivery system. Whenever I'm networking with healthcare leadership and the conversation inevitably turns to what's the evidence, SIREN is the place I refer them to. And because it's such a frequent referral, I thought it would be valuable for the consortium and our stakeholders to be aware of what SIREN does and understand how to use their resource library and to hear from one of their leaders on what they see as emerging trends at the federal level. And so we're really happy that you've joined us today to learn about this practical tool. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to our consortium director, Dr. Charles Mathias, who's uh, the newest member of our team, and he's going to introduce Caroline and, and get us rolling. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. I'm thrilled to be stepping in to our new role as a consortium director. Uh, during this past year, the number of offerings and activities of the consortium has grown, so we knew we needed to expand to kind of keep up with that growth. So um, I'm one of several new positions the consortium has created. Um, I'm, as you know, Rice University is based in Houston, Texas, but I'm actually supporting this program remotely from my home base here in San Antonio, where I've worked for many years as a uh, health policy expert on topics of mental illness and substance use. But I'm excited to address non-medical drivers more directly through the work with the consortium. About the consortium, we have a ambitious plan for the year ahead. Uh, we'll be rolling out a series of webinars like the one today. Um, we have some upcoming listening sessions to gather your insights, uh, which will inform a report that we're preparing ahead of next uh, legislative session on policy options that Texas may consider for boosting health through addressing non-medical drivers. Um, be on the lookout for information about our annual meeting, which will be again in December this year. Uh, you won't want to miss it. And finally, we continue to collect information for our program index, which is the repository for non-medical drivers of health programs underway in Texas. So if you have a program, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, we're excited that you're here today for this presentation by Dr. Caroline Fichtenberg. There will be time for after the presentation uh, to answer your questions. So if you think of questions as they arise, drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring them along the way, and we'll open up for Q&A after her talk. Uh, as a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded, and we'll share that recording with you on our YouTube channel after the event, along with a very short request for survey to give us feedback and ideas for future sessions. We'll also share with you a PDF copy of the slides you see today. Uh, delivering our presentation is Dr. Caroline Fichtenberg. She is the co-director of SIREN and a research scientist in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In these roles, she leads efforts to conduct, catalyze, and disseminate high-quality research on health sector strategies to reduce health inequities by addressing the non-medical drivers of health. Dr. Fichtenberg also has extensive federal policy experience, including as the director for the Center for Public Health Policy at the American Public Health Association, APHA, and as a health policy advisor uh, to the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fichtenberg, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to pull up my slides and get going. Um, so I'm excited today to tell you more about SIREN, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network. Um, we are a uh, research and dissemination center at the University of California, San Francisco, so on the West Coast. Um, our, our goal is really to improve research on social and medical care integration. 
And we do that by conducting research ourselves, by supporting researchers, and by synthesizing and disseminating research. Speaking of synthesizing and disseminating research, one of the main tools that we have at SIREN is our evidence and resource library. This evidence and resource library is a searchable database of research and implementation tools about healthcare-based social determinants of health interventions. Included in there is uh, more than 3,000 um, resources um, that are cataloged and available um, to be viewed um, and searched, et cetera. And I'm gonna give you right now a little bit of a tour of the evidence and resource library. So let me um, go ahead and change my screen sharing to show this, our website. Great. Has the screen sharing changed? Yeah, okay. Yes. So this is our website um, at sirennetwork.ucsf.edu. You can also find us if you just search, if you Google Siren UCSF, we'll come up. Um, and um, our evidence and resource library is accessed through this orange button on the top right of our website. And this is, um, as I mentioned, it's a repository of over 3,000 articles, resources. Um, we have um, uh, uh, peer-reviewed research as well as anything else that's been published that we have been able to find related to um, non-medical drivers of health interventions in healthcare. Um, so every single month, the way we put this together is that every single month we search the literature, we have Google searches and we put together and we add to the library whatever we found that month. We catalog it based on whether it's peer reviewed research or non peer reviewed, whether it's commentaries or tools and toolkits, et cetera. We catalog it based on the study design, based on the population. So whether it's children and youth or complex patients or homeless individual, Medicaid insured, et cetera. Um, we catalog it for the research resources based on what kinds of outcomes are um, examined in the research. And we catalog it by what we call social determinants of health, what you're calling non-medical drivers. Um, and we have a long list of those. And then we further catalog it by whether or not it is specifically focused on screening research and whether or not it's a SIREN resource, so something that we specifically have produced. So um, as an example of the kinds of things that you can do here is let's say that you really wanted to look at things related to screening and you really wanted to see kind of reviews related to screening because that's kind of like a synthesis of, of what's been published. So you would click on review under study design, you would click on the uh, screening research button down here, submit the search, and it pulls up 68 resources. Oh, I'm not sure why all of a sudden it's getting so big. Uh, what did I do to make that happen? Excuse me, let me... There we go, okay. Um, let me run that again to give you a sense of, of what that pulls up. So again, a number of resources, it pulls up 68 resources. All of them are reviews um, that are summarizing. So for example, you have screening tools to address social determinants of health in the United States, a systematic review, and then you can click on each of these and get the um, abstract or the summary of the resource. And then if you click on view the resource, that'll take you to the original source. 
And then if you're interested in downloading these results, you also have the ability to do that at the bottom here by clicking download now. So there's all sorts of searches that you can be doing here, obviously, based on all these different um, uh, ways that we categorize the research. You can also type in a keyword um, and use that if you're looking for something very specific. So that's the evidence and resource library. I wanna highlight a, a um, one other thing that I think people use a lot on our website, and this is the screening tool comparison tables. So one of the other things that we've done is that we have compiled in one place uh, many of the different screening tools that are used um, across the sector. And um, here is, it's not the most um, visually appealing, but what is visible here is basically a table where across the, the columns are different screening tools. So you see here it's a tool developed by the uh, AFP. Here's a tool that we found that was um, used. Uh, it, it's another tool that we found that was published, the AHC tool, et cetera. So these are a whole variety of different tools. Um, and then across the rows are all of the different um, uh, non-medical drivers of health categories that could be screened for. And one of the things that I think is most useful about this tool is that, for example, you can click on, these are all hyperlinked. So you can click here on housing security, instability, homelessness questions, and it'll pull up all of the questions across all the tools for homelessness um, and housing insecurity. So if you're really interested in comparing across tools, how different tools ask about this, this is a really, really great tool to be able to do that. Um, the other way that you can access this, um, so just to show you that there's a, if you wanna see all the different, um, you can go this way to see all the different um, tools that are in here. Another way that you can do this is you can download this as an Excel table. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like. where you can get all the same information um is the excel table showing or not yet yep we can see it great so this gives you an easier way to see all of the different tools and the numbers here correspond to the number of questions for each domain um and then the question detail in the second tab gives you the actual question content. So this is another way that you could see, you know, for uh, food insecurity, here are all the different ways that people are asking these questions across these different tools. And again, this is accessible through the, um, by looking for the social needs screening tool comparison, which is at the top of the, evidence and resource library page on our website. That's the evidence and resource library. Before I and our and um, the other tools that are accessible to it, I also the other thing I would highlight is that we do have a whole category of tools and toolkits. People are often asking for like, can do you have something to help us with actual implementation? And so that's another, I think, um, category of, uh, of resource that can be really helpful. Um, to be looking for. Let's see. Not quite. There we go. So it brings up 85 different tools and toolkits um, that you can use to, and you can further refine if you want some specifically about, you know, Medicaid insured, et cetera. You can further refine or just homelessness. Any questions about the evidence and resource library? Um, before I move on to other things. Dr. Frickenberg, I was, I was wondering about the screening tools. Do you, are you finding that that list of, for the screening comparison that you're doing, does that list just keep growing and growing? And in your monthly scan of articles, are you seeing like kind of consolidation where people are publishing and talking about, you know, maybe a smaller list of those tools? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's been kind of a plateau in terms, I feel like we're not seeing as many new screening tools being published. And I would say that the two that I see that we see people use the most are the Accountable Health Communities uh, screening tool. This is the one that was developed by CMS for the Accountable Health Communities model. Um, and then the other one is the prepare, um, the prepare tool um, that was developed by uh, the National Association of Community Health Centers and, and APCHO. Um, so I would say those are the two that I think we're seeing the most these days um, in response to your question. Thank you. And Lori, thank you for that. Yeah, the resource list is actually updated every single month. We're adding new things. <clears throat> I have a follow on question to, yeah. to Charles's um, and maybe you're going to talk about this later, but do we see, do, do you anticipate any coalescing around? I mean, you just mentioned two that are, that are the most popular, but um, in Texas, we have a new bill um, that is um, directed uh, toward pregnant women and Medicaid and the, the legislature, when they put the bill in place, directed um, the State Health and Human Services Commission to develop a screening tool to be used. And so they went through a lot of this and came up with their own. And, and so now we have it in addition to all of these others. And, and do you have any thoughts on where this is going as it becomes increasingly, quote unquote, popular um, and required to do screening um, that we don't drive ourselves too crazy with 18 million ways to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally, even if people are putting together, quote unquote, new tools, um, the um, ideally people are using kind of um, uh, similar questions as part of those tools. So an example for that is food insecurity. You know, there was a lot of work done to develop a fair, a really robust measure of food insecurity. It's called the hunger vital signs. It's two questions. It was validated against a much longer questionnaire that was developed by the USDA to measure food insecurity. Um, and it has really good um, sensitivity and, and specificity. And so ideally, as people put together tools, it would be really great if they're using those kinds of measures for the individual domain. So maybe you don't wanna ask all the same, like prepare is a really long tool. Maybe you want something shorter, um, but ideally you're using these more validated questions. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah. So I think that that's what I would say about that. Um, I'm, look, I'm seeing the questions in the chat about the languages. And what I do think that we have, yeah, we do have in the table um, this, uh, let's see, let me share the table again. So we do have in the table one of the, um, one of the rows that we have lists the additional languages that the tool is available in, at least at the time that we put it in this table. Um, and I don't see, so someone mentioned that there is an AHC, a version of the AHC tool in Spanish, is that right? We'll have to update our table if that's the case. But we do indicate here when we, um, you know, which, tools are available in which languages. So prepare, for example, is apparently available in 32 languages. Um, North Carolina Medicaid has its own screening tool. And I guess we should put Texas in here as well. So I'll get that from you all. Um, and that's available also in Spanish. Let me see if I can get back to the chat, if anything else has come up. So yeah, so we do try to add the additional languages as we're aware of them. Right, well, let me move on then um, to continuing the my presentation. I do wanna share that in addition to 
the resource library. Um, the other thing that we have uh, on the website, and am I, am I back to the slide presentation? Yes. Great. Um, so the other thing I wanna make you all aware of is our newsletter. So this is a monthly newsletter. And in our newsletter, we have uh, announcements about events that we host, as well as events that other people host. So for example, here we have an event coming up June 5th, where we're gonna be talking about food insecurity interventions with several food insecurity experts. We're really excited about that. Um, and then we also have the list of new uh, articles that have been published um, since the last newsletter. So this can be an easy way kind of to scan through and see, oh, is there some new study that's come out that's particularly relevant to the work that I'm doing um, that I wanna look at? Um, and so this is an, an easy way to kind of stay on top of the literature, stay on top of what's happening in this space. And you can sign up for the newsletter if you go to our website and you go to that link. Um, or if you, um, and I can put this, or if you just go to our website um, and at the bottom of the website, it'll have a place where you can sign up for the newsletter. Great. So the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna be telling you about some of the work that we have done um, at Siren related to social interventions. Um, and first I'm gonna be talking about, um, about a new conceptual model that we developed and published um, earlier this year uh, based on our um, observation of some of the research that was coming out um, and things that led us to. So the, um, the kind of, uh, I think, kind of typical thinking or the most common thinking around why we want to screen and refer and navigate is that, uh, that we want to do it so that patients receive social needs assistance and then that leads their social needs to decrease and thereby, and therefore their health will improve and their utilization and costs will decrease. This is kind of the standard thinking around um, social, inter how, how these interventions work for referring. Um, what we um, observed, however, um, is that there were studies coming out that were finding that, um, that were finding impacts on health or impacts on utilization and costs without impacts on social needs. So for example, last May, the Accountable Health Communities model, which is this uh, 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 model uh, where individuals were screened and navigated to resources, and there were roughly 30 sites across the country, including I think at least one in Texas. Um, and this report came out finding that there were benefits, there were utilization and cost decreases. So ED visits went down and costs went down, but, um, but social needs um, did not decrease. And so that allowed us to really think about, well, how is it that these referral and navigation could be improving utilization and costs without necessarily changing the social needs? And I should add that this was a randomized control trial, so, so robust, robust evidence. And so what we did after kind of thinking through and reviewing a lot of the literature in this space is realize that there were other pathways through which the screening and navigation could help patients. So one of them was through emotional support. And what we found here, this was work that we had done in some of, in one of our studies where we had interviewed patients who had received referral um, and navigation. And one of the things that came up in those conversations was the way in which having that kind of a conversation provided emotional support. So when the, this is a, a, a participant in an intervention, um, that said when the navigator called and she just asked, how are you doing? Just knowing that somebody cares, even if I didn't need anything at the time, just her calling to check up on me was really nice. That's nice to have people in the community reach out and just see how you're doing. If you need anything, food, or are you having issues with this or that? You need that as a parent. Sometimes you feel alone, you know? And we found this in our study. We found it in other studies. Um, the, this uh, having a navigator reach out and ask about things that aren't the typical things that are part of healthcare made people feel cared for 
in a way that we think might be providing some benefits in terms of stress reduction that could lead to some health benefits. So we think that's another potential way that screening and navigation um, may have an impact. The second pathway that um, kind of came up when we thought about this and reviewed the literature was the fact that um, when individuals work with navigators, even if the navigators are intended to um, really help access uh, resources not related to medical care, if there are issues related to medical care access, those navigators will work on those. And this is something that came out actually in the accountable health communities model, but we also saw it in some other research. So for example, um, in a randomized control trial of a community health worker intervention, which is the impact uh, model out of UPenn, almost 25% reported that the most help, this is a patient's reported the most helpful component of the CHW intervention was support for establishing primary care. So when you have these conversations, when navigators are working or community health workers are working with patients, they are naturally going to address the healthcare needs as well as other needs when they come up. And this is also, um, this is a patient quote from the intervention that we did at UCSF. The intervention was like a wake up call of, okay, it's time for you to take care of yourself. Take a day out of your week to call somebody or schedule an appointment or even go to your appointment. So it's also helping caregivers attend to their own needs. Then the fourth uh, pathway that um, also jumped out at us was the fact that screening, even without referral or navigation, generates information that can enable healthcare teams to tailor healthcare services to their patients' needs. And this is a pathway that was described in the National Academy's report from 2019. It was called the adjustment pathway. So the idea being that care gets adjusted based on the social risks. It's something that um, honestly, you know, we think that providers, particularly providers working with a lot of uh, patients facing, facing economic insecurity, do kind of just automatically without necessarily thinking about it, uh, because this is how you provide high quality care. Um, but we saw some specific examples of it in this research study where, um, where uh, providers were asked how they might use information about a patient's social risk and how they might change their, their recommendations or the care that they would provide based on that information. So putting all this together, the model that we developed has these four pathways um, with the idea being that, yes, there is probably this pathway related to improving social needs, but we think that there are other ways in which either screening or referral and navigation are improving health outcomes. And we think that this is an important, um, it's important to be thinking about all these different pathways when developing interventions. I'm going to talk now um, about um, research that we've done related to social risk screening and some of the barriers that sometimes come up um, uh, in clinical settings. So some of the barriers that are most commonly discussed or the most commonly come up that we hear about um, in terms of you know why it's hard to implement screening. One is that providers or care teams are uncomfortable with the idea of doing it. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Then there are also concerns about whether or not patients are uncomfortable. And then there's been a lot of issues also and concern around whether or not patients actually want this. Are they interested in getting assistance from their healthcare teams? And I'm gonna go through each of these. Um, so uh, with the provider care team discomfort, one of the biggest thing that comes up is uh, people saying, well, we can't scream if we don't know how to address the needs. 
If we don't have resources in place to specifically address needs, it's not ethical to be screening. And I think this is where um, some of our research is particularly helpful. We did a study of, um, well, first of all, I think one of the, before jumping to that, one of the things to think about is that, as we mentioned, addressing social needs may not be the only way that these uh, programs benefit patients. So I think that this is a, a useful model to go through with providers um, and care teams um, to try to um, address some of these concerns around not having robust programs to address um, social needs. Um, the other thing is that we found in our research with patient perspectives that actually patients uh, see the benefit in um, screening, even if it's unrelated to addressing the needs. So this was, um, I'm going to show you a quote from a study that we did um, where we interviewed 100 patients in 10 different sites across the country and asked them about their experience of social needs screening. And one patient, um, one of the themes that came out of those interviews is, is that exemplified by this quote where a patient said, well, I think it's important for it to be in the chart because our medical providers then can, you know, take into consideration and look at the entire person and not just the symptoms that are coming in. And another um, patient said, this is really helpful because that way my doctor knows why I have headaches due to stress because I have no place to live. So I think this is another thing that's important for providers to understand that their patients actually see value in their providers understanding their complete situation, understanding their uh, conditions in which they live because that has a direct implication for their health care. And then the other thing that we found that was really interesting also is that patients don't really expect their healthcare teams to fix their social needs. That's not what they go to health providers for. Um, and here's another quote that exemplifies that. As far as the healthcare providers, I don't really see it as their responsibility. I think they should ask the questions. I'm not sure that they should be responsible for helping them. And so I think that this can help take the pressure off providers a little bit. Um, to know that patients want their providers to know this information because of the importance for their health care, not necessarily because they expect their health care teams to do something about their housing instability or their food insecurity, et cetera. Next thing I want to talk about is the concerns the providers may have around patient discomfort. And the data I'm going to show comes from the same study where in addition to interviewing people, we did a survey of 1,000 people, um, 100 people at 10 different sites, and asked them how they felt about being screened. We gave them a screener, the AHC screener, and then asked them how did they feel about that? Did they find that this was appropriate? Um, and we found here on the left-hand side, this shows the acceptability of social screening, the percent saying very appropriate, somewhat appropriate. And that's, we found that 79% of the patients in this survey said that they thought that the social risk screening was very or somewhat appropriate to be, um, to be asked this. And over half of them thought that it was very appropriate. So high levels of, um, of acceptability of the social risk screening in healthcare settings. And this was a mix of primary care and emergency department settings. So both settings were included here. And we didn't see any differences between ED um, and, um, and primary care in terms of acceptability. And then the other thing that we asked them is how comfortable they were with the data being included in the EHR. And although this was a little bit lower than the overall acceptability, it was still very high. So again, this idea of this information being included in the EHR is something that the patients are comfortable with. And of course, there are exceptions, and it's important to be attuned to those. And there can be situations that are particularly sensitive. Um, but to think about in terms of the general case, there is a high level of acceptability. The final thing I want to talk about is something that has come up, which is um, that patients sometimes will not respond to offers of assistance. 
Um, and we did some research to try to understand why that was, because we had primary care, a lot of different care settings that were offering resources, and they were seeing less than 50% of individuals who disclosed a need saying that they wanted help. Um, and so here are some of the reasons that we found um, for why patients weren't interested. One, and this was a really interesting one, uh, patients said they don't want to take resources away from someone else. So these are individuals who, yes, have a need, but don't feel that it's as severe as that of others and say, you know, I don't want to take resources from somebody that might need them more than me and that I have less resources than me. I thought that was a really interesting um, perspective. Um, some of the reasons why individuals didn't want resources is that they were skeptical about the help that their healthcare team can provide. And I think this kind of goes with this idea of that there isn't necessarily an expectation that your healthcare team is going to help you with things. And so people may say, you know, if you're asking about housing, oops, excuse me, explain your partners to me. If you're not a housing entity, I don't understand why you're asking. I really don't. Now, this is an example of someone who's who's a little more skeptical of the whole enterprise. Um, and this highlights also the importance of being explicit about why you're screening um, because it's something that's new and that's unusual in a healthcare setting still. Um, and so it's important to explain the purpose. Um, another reason why patients may decline assistance is that available assistance is insufficient. And this quote exemplifies that. So the problem for a lot of people is that the help that claims to be available is subpar, doesn't work, or is not there. And that's a big factor in patients declining assistance. And this is an important thing to think about as well. You know, um, patients who have needs, this is not going to be, you know, that many of them will have explored a lot of the resources already available um, and may have been disappointed by what they find because um, we know, especially in areas like housing um, and a lot of issues that um, they're not always enough resources to meet the needs. Um, and so patients will become disillusioned. Um, with what's available. Um, another reason that I think is a really important one for thinking about how to do these programs is stigma and shame. Uh, a number of people express this as a challenge. And this is a quote from a patient saying, I don't know why I haven't called. I feel like it's just more me not wanting to accept help from other people. I just feel kind of bad or ashamed that I even need help in the first place. And I think one of the recommendations that come out of this is really the importance of, of thinking about these factors in the context of the fact that these are often stigmatized. Um, poverty is stigmatized um, in our country and um, the importance of having a compassionate approach um, and training staff really well in the staff who are gonna be screening, who are gonna be looking over screening questions um, to ensure that there is compassion there um, and to reduce any kind of stigmatization. And then um, I think this is a final reason, oh no, yeah, a final reason why um, people uh, do not, are, are not, patients are not interested in assistance. And that is the very real fear of negative consequences. And this is particularly true for parents and caregivers. So people will be scared if they have children and do not want child protective services to get involved if they do not have enough food, for example. And so this is another really important um, factor to take into consideration, particularly in pediatric settings, about the potential implications of um, what people may fear if they respond to these questions. And I think this is particularly true in a place like Texas also, where you have uh, a lot of um, people who may not have a legal status, uh, may not have legal legal status in the United States, um, and a lot of, obviously, uh, fear of not just protective services, but child protective services, but also immigration uh, services. So something else about, um, you know, highlighting the importance of being very clear about how the information is going to be used when the screening happens. Great. And then this is one last quote that I want to share that highlights again how screening is done matters. And this is another theme that came out of, of some of our research 
which is the importance of compassion for um, getting people to respond honestly um, to social needs screening. And this one says, I don't mind because if I feel like somebody is concerned, really concerned about me, I will answer the question. But if I feel like there's somebody just asking me the question, just to be asking me because as part of their job, I might not answer. So again, this goes to the um, stigmatization um, and the fact that people want patients overall are um, view this screening as a way for their care teams to get to know them and to understand their context. But if it's just a check the box kind of thing and people aren't really going to be paying attention to it or it's done in a stigmatizing way, uh, patients are not going to engage with it. So there are a few recommendations that I've mentioned along the way that I just want to summarize here. Um, one is, you know, the, the importance of um, having the, the care team members who do the screening, having sufficient time and empathy and training in these areas to connect with patients about social needs in non-judgmental ways. Um, I think it's very important to avoid perceptions of targeting based on race, ethnicity, preferred language, or other marginalization factors in terms of who gets screened. So we recommend a universal screening rather than targeted screening for that reason. Again, explaining why the screening is happening and how the information will be used is very important. Um, and then we recommend framing the screening in terms of the health implications. Um, we're asking about these issues because we know they can impact your health and your health care um, could be some of the things that you might want to say or might want to have your care team say when they're asking about social needs. Um, okay, I will end there um, with just uh, a thank you for all of you. And I look forward to um, any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Dr. Fichtenberg. That was a great overview, both of what SIREN resources are out there for our audience, but also what SIREN's research is showing about the patient experience in this space. Um, uh, there was a couple comments in the chat there. Uh, Christina Elizondo had talked about a resource that her uh, organization's using where they're using some motivational interviewing as part of a cl clinician coaching tool to kind of address some of these factors you're talking about where patients might be reluctant to, um, to accept social services. And I was wondering, if, Christina, do you want to unmute yourself and just add any comments about how your um, how this is going for you with this new coaching tool? Yes, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to speak and uh, just kind of chiming in and, and piggybacking on some of the things that we're talking about. I'm a, a dietitian by training and I'm a full-time food security program coordinator. And so when we're trying to address food insecurity, there's a lot of mental aspects that we have to take in consideration with the research. Um, depression leads to suicidal ideation. So lots of mental health factors. And typically as clinicians, you know, uh, a lot of us are not um, well-versed in that arena. And so this is a, a, a really great tool step-by-step -step on asking some open-ended questions and building that safe and trusting environment and building that rapport um, with our patients to address those needs. And, and then just for them to disclose that information because there is a lot of stigma. And I deal with veteran populations. So the pride and, and they're, they were in the military and, you know, they, they may not even know what food insecurity is and realize that they are food insecure because of food deserts and, and things of that nature. Um, so this is a great tool that we have um, collaborated with our National Food Security Office under BHA and our Healthy Living Team here in South Texas. So, and my apologies, it was on a share drive that I put in the chat box, but I, I will go ahead and download it and um, add it to this chat for your review. Another nice piece that we did add is called the ACORN screening, which addresses not only food insecurity, but other social, all the non-medical drivers of health. Um, and that was, uh, it was piloted under our VHA Office of Health Equity. And so we added that uh, additional component just to address other uh, targeted domains um, during that conversation. Sometimes it takes a little bit long, um, but normally we've got the dietitians or social work services that can really build that type of environment um, 
and being able to take the time to address all those non-medical drivers of health at that time of the visit. Thank you, Christina. This this is enlightening because I know motivational interviewing is becoming more popular in healthcare settings, primarily to get patients to engage in kind of the next step of their medical care. So this is revealing that you know we're applying, we're seeing applications of this tool to meet social needs as well. So thank you for sharing. Sure. And I was just going to also add, and we had some dietitians that were talking to our veterans and they didn't even address food insecurity. They were actually suicidal at the time of the visit. So that was pretty alarming as well. Um, so we just want to kind of make it, again, I think it's just really um, important to address and, and build that rapport. Um, it's very sensitive questions and, and they're vulnerable of veterans. And sometimes they are already in a state of suicide um, where it's really important to be mindful of that during the time of the visit as well. Dr. Fichtenberg, I saw you just added to the chat there on this topic. Go ahead and tell us what you're thinking there. Yeah, so empathic inquiry was actually an approach based uh, partially on motivational interviewing that was developed by the Oregon Primary Care Association a number of years ago, specifically focused on um, how to discuss social needs with um, with patients. And so there's a good number of resources on that website for um, learning more about that approach, but I would encourage people to check that out. And I'm so glad, uh, Christina, that you mentioned the ACORN screening tool, because I don't think that's one that we have in our in our uh, table of screening tools. So we'll have to add that one. I'll include that separately as well, um, uh, just for everyone to see. Great. Dr. Fichtenberg, you did a great job of kind of explaining, I think, a, a, a myth that some folks have that just screening alone, like you you demonstrate how screening alone has positive effects on, on the patients. A lot of us here in Texas are really in the middle of implementing screening programs because of new mandates. And so one, that's timely that you're telling us like that is a valuable experience for our patients. But I think we're all thinking that, okay, the next wave of these mandates is going to be now, what do you do for them? You know, beyond navigation, how are you meeting these needs? So is there a good place on Siren's site to look for like things about implementing that next step of, of addressing the needs? Mm, that's a great question. Um, we're in the process right now of doing a review of research on navigation, on referral and navigation. So it, it's not out yet. Um, it probably won't be done until later this year, but we will have a resource um, on that um, coming uh, down the pike later this year. Um, and then we also know that there's another group uh, that we work with closely um, at OCHIN, um, which is a net, you know, a, a shared um, uh, IT system for a number of community health centers. Um, and they are also developing a resource um, related to uh, referral programs. And theirs should be ready, I think, sometime this summer. So I think there's going to be some new resources on that. Um, I would say those are probably going to be two of the most kind of concise resources. There are, as I mentioned, um, in our resource and evidence library, we do have that toolkit section. And I think that there are in there some toolkits that kind of are about referral and, and, um, and navigation. Um, we haven't separated those out yet from uh, from things that might be about something else. Uh, but I think you, there are definitely some resources in the library as well. Um, but I think as you point out, I mean, I we're gonna we're we're we realize that the the federal led you know the um, uh, uh, you know accreditation and uh, quality metrics are probably gonna start requiring some kind of, you know, something's been done. What we hope is that that also includes, um, you know, just taking account of this information as part of your health care is doing something about it. Um, and so we hope that it's a broad kind of um, approach um, that, that provides, you um, you know, care teams with the flexibility to implement this in ways that um, that make the most sense 
for them given their resources, et cetera. Um, one thing I will say that, um, you know, that comes, that, that the other thing from our conceptual model is, you know, I think there's been a lot of interest in the platforms, this idea that you can have a technology tool that kind of anybody can use to figure out, you know, what resources exist um, and refer people to those resources. And I think there's been a lot of interest in the healthcare sector in these platforms. You know, what our conceptual model suggests is that the interaction with a human being is part of the important benefit that can come from these kind of interventions. And that uh, combined with the fact that the platforms are just really hard to implement, they're hard to get people to use them, I think um, means that we're also hoping that this doesn't just push people just to go the technology route. Uh, because we really think that it's interactions with caring human beings that um, that is important um, and a really important element of these interventions. For sure, for sure. And I'll note, Christina did add a PDF of both the clinician coaching guide and a corn screening instrument for those of you who are who would like to download it. Those those links work now. Um, I do want to give folks a chance to unmute and ask any questions they have. If you could just uh, unmute yourself and, and come on with your with your questions. This is Lori Long from Texas Health Resources, and I just want to say thank you. It's a great presentation that will really help in training our team on um, the reason, uh, you know, why there is value in doing this and that we can really modify our treatment plans accordingly. Like if you know that there's a food desert, maybe there's not a lot of resources out there, but then you know, well, let's give you some more educational knowledge on how to eat healthier with the food that is available, right? Yeah. And the same thing with fine, you know, financial limitations. Uh, I know that the pharmacy, you know, recommendation that I'm giving you Maybe it's above what we, you know, uh, is the ideal, but here is a, a generic drug or here's supplemental protein that can also assist. So I do agree exactly with what you're saying that we need to start messaging that more with our team, that you are providing a, a benefit to the patient if you know more about the patient and how really they become a part of that treatment plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I can't do what you're recommending as the ideal, so how can we rethink this? And so we need to really think about that as practitioners. So thank you for this. It's really going to help with the messaging. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Any other folks have questions I would like to come on and unmute yourself, please. It's definitely helpful to hear that it resonates um, and addresses a need. And I saw there was a point in the chat where I think there was a call out to Rhonda and Mimi around the idea of like providing emotional support. Is that? Yeah, Rhonda yes. and Minnie have a study on it. She can tell you about it. Oh, great. Yeah. We've done um, a couple studies now actually with lay person callers. So no healthcare background. I'm really pulling from folks in the community and it, the calls are very participant focused, participant dependent on what they wanna talk about, how long they wanna talk. And it's really asking them, how are you doing? What do you wanna talk about? Um, and the focus has been just on hearing and learning from those people, but our measurements have found um, with a senior population Meals on Wheels, we're able to significantly reduce um, depression, loneliness and anxiety. And then a second program that we've just wrapped up and are getting ready to report on, we worked with FQHC patients who had uncontrolled diabetes. And with those calls alone, just empathetic calls, we were able to have a significant drop in A1C, a half a point across the whole population. Wow. And for those that had a PHQ um, above five, we were able to get a 1.2 drop in A1C between the control and the intervention arm. So. Wow. I think you're you're spot on. People people just want to know that somebody cares about them. Yeah. And they can do a better job in managing their own health if you can give them that headspace to really um, feel better about what's going on with them in their lives. That somebody somebody calls and somebody cares. Yeah, 
I think we need to add these um, studies to our presentation. That's powerful. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Rhonda, you, you should send, I mean, one of yours has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. You ought to send yeah. what you've got to Caroline so that they oh. get Okay, sure, yeah. Well, I hate I'm to... Claudia Gentry. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I just wanted to, a great presentation. I enjoyed all of it. Uh, but what we've done is the prepare assessment. I work with CHWs. We are embedded in several practices all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And we noticed that there was a lot of pushback from the patients with that assessment. So the CHWs are the ones that do the assessment. But we noticed that after we trained the front staff, the front desk, and the physicians, that the pushback, we don't have, we're not having that. The doctors now are very encouraging to the patients to participate because they trust the physicians. And we've seen a great, a tremendous change in all of that just by training the physicians and the front staff. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing that experience. I hate to cut this conversation short, but we're getting up to the top of the hour. So I just wanna thank you all for attending and Dr. Fichtenberg for sharing this valuable information. I do wanna put in a plug for our program index. Um, this index is important for demonstrating, you know, who's doing what in the space and what's working so we can all come together to learn together. So if you have a program addressing non-medical drivers, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Jack, your program manager can be reached at jk90 at rice.edu. Just so you know, our next uh, meeting opportunities are June 6th and 11th. These will be two identical sessions where you can share policy ideas um, that the state may consider in addressing non-medical drivers. And this is in a workshop style uh, for policy savvy uh, folks in our community. The next learning session will be June 27th, which will be with the uh, about the national landscape when it comes to non-medical drivers and led by the National Alliance to Impact the Social Determinants of Health or NASDO. And we have an uh, events page that you can register at uh, our website, which is driversofhealthtx.org. Uh, thank you for a robust conversation. We're grateful for your input. We really want your feedback on this webinar. So we'll send out a short survey along with PDF of the uh, slides later in this week. Uh, please help us know what other content that you would like to see. Uh, this consortium would be successful uh, by what we make of it together and, and through your input. So thank you for being here and let's keep in touch. Thank you so much for having me. Have a lovely day. Bye, everybody.